pop out chat. Oh, welcome back to Sunday Science, everybody. Glad you guys could join us today. Uh, today we're kicking off a series that's going to run for a couple of weeks. Uh, it's everything you need to know about the world of climate science. Since we're all on this world together, we all have to deal with it. So <laughs> this is, uh, just so everyone knows, this isn't some, uh, you know, pushing a political agenda type thing. Sunday science is always going to be about science. And while we all have our opinions this way or that, that's the show is only going to be discussing the science behind what we understand about our planet, the science of how every day affects our planet. It's just about science. So, uh, might as well uh, let everyone know we do have a special guest that's going to be joining us for the series, uh, Scientist Mel. Yay. I know. Yay! Yay! <laughs> Yay, Scientist <laughs> Mel! Uh, it's, uh, this is going to be a real fun series, don't get me wrong. I, I'm pretty excited about this one. I've been, I think we've all been putting in a decent amount of work on this, and I I'm just really excited for it. So uh, everyone welcome scientist Mel. And if you haven't already hopped over to her channel and sub subscribed, I suggest you go and do so because there's some amazing content over there and you won't be disappointed. Indeed. Thank you. I that. I'm glad you like it. <laughs> I do. It's been a lot of fun watching the work that you do. So. That being said, I do believe that we are going to let Psy Strike kick things off and start the show. Hmm. Okay, well, thank you. Hello, everyone. And uh, as Eddie said, welcome back. Uh, yeah, um, essentially, I'm just going to talk about how how we keep an eye on on uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and how we uh, how we know how much we have, how much we have had. And all that sort of stuff. And uh, hopefully you'll find it fairly interesting. I know I do. Uh, all right, well, let us start here. Yeah. This fine fellow would be Roger Revelle. He was born back in 1909. And um, he was a scientist and a scholar who was among the early scientists to study anthropogenic global warming. Um, uh, back, in, back in the 50s, um, Roger decided it might be wise to begin monitoring concentrations of CO2 in the atmosphere. Um, so he and, and Char Charles Keeling began monitoring uh, atmospheric carbon dioxide at an observatory in Mauna Loa on the Big Island of Hawaii, which looks kind of like this. There it is. Uh, let's see. Yeah, this observatory is uh, at an altitude of 3,400 meters. It's in a good place to measure air masses that represent large areas. Um, it's away from major centers that would be um, releasing large concentrations of CO2 and things like that. That would skew readings and give you a, a false impression of what was going on. Um, let's see. I'm sure so you... Yep. Part of what I'm hearing is that, aside from incredibly amazing dark skies, <laughs> there's a lot more scientific research to be had in Hawaii than just dark skies in the middle of nowhere. Indeed, and some some damn fine beaches. Uh, <laughs> yes, being 
uh, as I mentioned, being away from big cities and things like that, and um, it, it, it does make it a good place for for uh, atmospheric endeavors such as such as this. Um, and we've gotten some. I'm sure everyone's seen this graph. Um, this is from uh, this, this is what's been taken uh, from this site from the 50s up until this this graph ends at 05, and it's uh, let's see. People could stop messaging me. I'd be happy. Um, <laughs> <this. laughs> yeah, it. Uh, uh, this this graph, um, it, you know, show is a fairly good representation of recent history, which is, uh, uh, as I mentioned, they're they're in a fine spot to uh, to do so. Now, um, how how they do so? How you can how you can take air and determine how much um, how much carbon dioxide is contained therein? Uh, this is the part that I found quite interesting. Uh, one of the ways that it's done is with uh, infrared light. And let's take a look at this little fellow. Ooh, infrared photometer. Yeah. Indeed, indeed. It's in my area now. <laughs> <laughs> indeed. All right. So I so I trust if I botch any of the science, I, I trust you will jump in and stop me from misinforming people, please. <laughs> okay, this is quite all right. This is pretty fun. <laughs> the I've worked with infrared spec before, so that's neat. <laughs> Indeed, yeah. The, the the last thing I would want to do is misinform. But anyway, it's um, it, it's not uh, an incredibly complicated device to uh, to understand, uh, as you can see by the diagram. I hope it shows up clearly on everyone's screen. Um, they pump regular you know air uh, taken from the uh, the atmosphere through the cylindrical cell. The one we're talking about at the moment is at the top, and it's got flat windows at both ends. An infrared light is uh, beamed through the sample, and it goes through the uh, through the air that's being that's in there, and it's measured by a detector. Um, now, um, carbon dioxide absorbs infrared radiation, and more CO2 in the cell is more absorption, um, and less light hits the detector. Um, then the de detected signal, which is obviously is a, uh, um, an output voltage. Is converted into a measure of the amount of CO2 that's contained in the air that's in the sample chamber. Uh, now, uh, to as a, a method of calibration while in operation, there's a reference sample with the known quantities uh, that it's the exact same infrared source is beamed through at exactly the same time. This allows for um, the continuous calibration to make sure that your readings are somewhere in the realm of reality. And uh, let us see here. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, oh, yes. Mel. How this works, I can say really quickly what your schematic is here. Oh, you want me by all means, please join in. Okay. So you have your sample box and your reference box. So your reference is going to be kind of like um, similar to what you're expecting inside your sample so you can compare wavelengths. Also, if you're talking about a liquid sample, your reference might be your blank. So depending on the purity of your sample, that's going to affect what your reference is. Your IR source is coming through and it's concentrated with the lens. As it passes through, then it hits your detector. And that detector is going to detect the particular infrared frequency that is picked up with the sample. So that way, if you're expecting a particular like carbon dioxide, I don't know right off the top of my head where it shows up in the infrared spectrum in regards to the wavelength. So the stronger the signal, the higher the concentration. Does that make sense? Indeed it does. <laughs> So if you have like a really tall peak that comes out, that's like, you know, super, super tall peak, then that means you have a pretty high amount of concentration of a particular um, sample that's hitting at a wavelength. So you can pass a wavelength through there and if it absorbs it and then you your detector figures out what it is that it absorbed. And so that way, um, whatever your high peak is, that's that's going to be that's going to determine the concentration 
So however tall your peak is, that's related to the concentration of the carbon dioxide in your sample. Oh, very nice. Awesome. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Great. All right. And that's, uh, okay, that's that. That's the kind of thing going on on Mauna Loa. Um, now, uh, another interesting method uh, to keep an eye on what's going on in the present uh, in the atmosphere with respect to uh, CO2 and that sort of thing is one of my favorite things, lasers from space. What you gotta love better? space lasers. <laughs> what could be better? <laughs> Indeed, there, and it, honestly, we had we had a show about lasers uh, uh, quite a while ago. I, I'm, I'm sure you recall that one, Andy. Oh and, yeah. Um, and uh, there there are so many things that can be done. This particularly, we're talking about measuring uh, this measuring carbon dioxide, which is done. Oddly enough, the concept is very similar to what we just looked at. Um, that uh, it, it depends on light being reflected from the surface and being picked up again by the uh, by the satellite, so it requires well quite a pulse, and um, they'll be done on on two different frequencies, so you have this, the same comparison, two different wavelengths, we'll say, uh, of light, so that you have the same comparisons that that uh, that we were just talking about, and it's. Um, it, it, it's certainly another way to accomplish the same goal, and one that I find to be quite interesting. Um, now, uh, any, any comments on uh, space lasers, anyone? I really want a space laser. That's all I got to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah I'm just going to say space lasers are awesome. But it, I agree, and there because there's so many things that can be done, so many things that can be measured. Um, I, the, when I was, uh, the last... Uh, uh, the, the the NASA social at uh, at uh, Goddard, uh, we, we were introduced to uh, ice yeah, sat, still, ice ice sat get out about that one. <laughs> yeah, that's um, uh, the, you know measuring the uh, and that's obviously something we we need to keep an eye on um, measuring the ice sheets and and what happens to them over time. So yeah, lasers. There's there are more uses for them every day. Now, um, both of these methods, I mean, there are, there are additional methods. Both of these methods um, are, are great for uh, what's going on now and what has been going on since the 50s. Uh, just, you know, great for the present, but, you know, what about the past? Like, you know, deep past. Uh, for that, it's fortunate we have, uh, we have the ability to take a look at that kind of stuff, too, and one of the best ways to do that is making use of ice cores. Um, as they do uh, preserve history, and I mean deep history. And let's see, I have a quick video on that. So let me bring that up. Here we go. It's a busy, freezing cold day inside the National Ice Core Lab in Denver, Colorado. We're gonna cut gas samples out of this core. Yay, my home! Scientists from Maine to California <laughs> here to cut pieces of precious Antarctic glacier ice to take back to their labs for study. We started the Ice Core project in 2005. With support from the National Science Foundation for a project called the West Antarctic Ice Sheet, or Waste Divide, Lab manager Mark Twickler and a team of scientists, engineers, and support personnel traveled to the bottom of the world to drill out and bring back these ice cores. The goal of the project, to collect and study perfectly preserved records of the distant past. The unique things about polar glaciers is each year that it snows there, the snow never melts. So you get one year of snow on top of the next year of snow. It compresses, so everything that fell out of the atmosphere, dust, salt from the ocean, volcanic ash, is preserved in that ice core. This particular ice sheet is more than 70,000 years old. The team drilled down more than two miles into it to retrieve these cores, which were then flown to the U.S. and stored in a giant 40 below zero freezer here at the ice core lab. Uh, inside this freezer contains more than 10 miles of ice cores collected from around the world. 
Twickler says the ice core's layers are like tree rings, each layer representing a year of weather and snow. We can tell what the, what the temperatures were. We can tell how rough the oceans were around Antarctica. We can tell how dusty Australia was. Scientists are keen to study the bubbles trapped in the cores, each a tiny pocket of air frozen in time. We can measure a variety of gases that were in the atmosphere at the time the bubbles were formed. Other scientists want to know how ice sheets melt over time. We don't necessarily have a really good handle on how the ice sheet as a whole will respond in a case of changing climate. Twickler says this icy blast from the past is helping researchers better understand the mechanics of climate change. And that, in turn, will help them make better predictions as to what a changing climate may mean for our future. For Science Nation, I'm Miles O'Brien. Okay. Well, that was very, very awesome. <laughs> that was very cool. It felt like, you know, school again, except, you know, it's video day. That was awesome. <laughs> no. <laughs> he said, that's a video. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, indeed. Oh, well, glad you enjoyed that. Um, yeah, I, I sheets are kind of cool. Um, they, they indeed. <laughs> and for... Go ahead. You know how damned excited I am about this. If this, uh, working with a particular company, but there's this, <clears throat> I might be able to actually go and be one of the people taking ice core samples. If I get through this third wave of interviews, it's been a couple of months. I haven't mentioned anything and that's kind of the that's kind of the work I would be doing if I get a go. So I'm really excited and hope I get to. That, that will be interesting. <laughs> that would be amazing. I hope you get it, and you'll have to take lots of pictures and send it to everybody. <laughs> Indeed. Oh yeah, absolutely. It would be. Yeah, I. Yeah, a, a couple of hangouts ago, I already science gasmed all over the place about this. So. Uh, I won't try. I'm not going to wreck this one up by getting all giddy about it again. But <laughs> we, I would. Be, I really want that job. <laughs> we, we, all, we all remember, and of course, we will wish you the best of luck in in securing that job, Andy. That would be cool. You have uh, to go. It's, it's so it's in Antarctica. There should be penguins. There should be. Is that in? I think it is in Antarctica that you can find penguins. Indeed. I know it's one of the poles. I get like mixed. I get them mixed up sometimes. <laughs> you can find them. In, you can find them in Australia too. They're little blue penguins yeah. there, and and they, yeah. are, they do have weird little. Same in uh, Argentina and Chile, actually. And the uh, the little blue penguins but, from Australia are incredibly fond of people. They, really? Yes. They they uh, brought a uh, a group of them to an aquarium and set up a very nice uh, thing for them uh, here in New Jersey, in Camden. Which, yeah, there's a reason to go to Camden. Okay, we'll stop talking about Camden now. But uh, <laughs> when, when the, okay. the, the interesting thing, this is way off topic, and I apologize. I'll be quick. Um, <laughs> when they bring in a new uh, a life form of any sort, um, they uh, finish its enclosure with all the, the glass that's exposed to the public, and they coat the inside of that with uh, paper that you can't see through because they want the animals to get used to their environment before they're exposed to people. And then they'll take them off one square at a time so as not to traumatize the animals and that they'll think, oh, predators have arrived. And the interesting thing about the little hmm. blue penguins is when they took the first square off and people were walking through on a normal, normal days at the, at the aquarium, they took off one square, all the penguins huddled around the square to see the people. <laughs> <laughs> so, there's apparently they're very, very, very sociable and, uh, and are very fond of people. Anyway, I should I should probably get back to ice cores, don't you think? <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, uh, anyway, all right. So uh, there, ice cores. Yes. Uh, so we've established ice sheets are pretty cool things. Um, they do let us go back in time uh, to sample air chemistry and temperature through deep history. And uh, now, uh, yes. Real Real quick, just as a teaser for a uh, upcoming portion, like I say, this is a series, and we are going to we are going to talk about it for a little while. Not so much that anyone's annoyed, but 
when it does come to the time capsule capabilities of certain aspects of our planet, there is one area where we get to go even further back in time that's very rarely touched upon. So look for that in an upcoming episode. It's going to be a lot of fun. Ooh, teasers. <laughs> right. Anyway. Uh, right. Uh, yeah. Um, with these ice cores, we can come up with a continuous timeline of uh, past climate going back hundreds of thousands of years. Um, when we look at uh, past concentrations, greenhouse, ga uh, greenhouse gases in ice layers, uh, and calculate how modern amounts of carbon dioxide, methane, compare to those of the past, and compare to cast, uh, past concentrations uh, to temperature. Kind of give us an idea of what's coming. Now, ice coring has been around since the 50s, which is convenient because we can kind of compare it uh, with Mount Loa, so, you know, a little sanity check and make sure that, uh, again, another way to check our data and make sure it's right. Um, Ice cores have pretty much been drilled worldwide, uh, notably in Greenland and Antarctica, um, where there's high rates of snow accumulation give you a good time resolution. Um, as we mentioned, bubbles, as you saw in the video, bubbles in the ice cores preserve samples of the Earth's atmosphere at the time. And by analyzing these ice cores, uh, we, learn, we can learn about the glacial interglacial cycles uh, atmospheric CO2 levels and climate stability throughout really deep history. Now, ice coring. You can't just grab any old ice core. Um, you have to know where you, you have to you have to uh, do your ice coring in specific places. And the reason for that, yeah, let me pull up another picture here. Here we go. Is that you want to be in an area where there's not a lot of lateral movement and mixing of ice layers and all that kind of stuff. Um, in um, uh, if if you're at the center of an ice sheet, um, that that's that's where the the layers are best preserved. Um, now dr drilling vertical holes in, in in ice in these areas. It was a pretty serious effort, um, requiring a batch of scientists and technicians, and uh, usually they camp out for a very long period of time to accomplish this. Um, and all right, I think uh, that's good for me for now. Andy, I believe you have some stuff to uh, to talk about there. Other other methods of uh, cool machines and things. Nope, forgot to unmute my mic. <laughs> <laughs> Hate when that happens. <laughs> uh, so I, I do have some uh, topics I would like to touch on. It does have to do mostly with certain machinery and how it functions and how we're able to actually take measurements from, you know, it, it's great to know how we sit down and drill into an ice core and, you know, I should say, drill into an ice sheet, take a core sample. But what happens with that once we get it back to, well, like the video showed earlier and where I live, what happens when it gets to Denver? What happens when it goes to the stable isotope lab here in Boulder? Well, <clears throat> the, the primary machine utilized that is going to give a lot of information about a lot of different things. And again, is one of those pieces of equipment that actually does need to be designed for a very, a very specific purpose is the mass spectrometer. So I'm sure everyone watching has heard a mass spec be tossed around somewhere in a TV show or somewhere along the lines. I'm sure you've heard someone talk about a mass spec, but what is what is that machine? What does it actually do? How do they work? What are, what are they? So I thought that that would be a good thing for me to touch on a little bit. And um, let's see, let, 
I, I'm told you have slides. <laughs> I do for the for the first time in this entire in this show's history. I actually I actually made slides. I, <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, and, and for some reason, I got booted. That was weird. Well, welcome back. I just thought it'd be funny. I booted you. No, no. That was the I did that not. was the quickest getting kicked out and brought back into a hangout that's ever existed. Indeed, I'm not sure why that happened. You just dropped. Yeah, out. that was really weird. Um, see if I can do this again. Okay. Not get kicked out. All right. As soon as it comes up, I will present to all. Up, oh, you're uh, you're presenting, but oddly enough, you're presenting me. Uh, click click on you in your <laughs> really in your screen. Yeah, in in your Hangouts thing. Click on you. Okay, I'm, I'm now I just your tabs. I'm like mass spectrometry, cyclotron, isotope definition. <laughs> yeah, Ooh, I just have a cascading <laughs> window of hell happening. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'm gonna hop out and rejoin real quick oh. because this is <laughs> making me dizzy. <laughs> All right. Let me uh here. <laughs> oh, the wonders of Hangouts. That's we, we need a we need a different teleconference. I guess I can talk, I can talk about mass spec while Andy's sorting out everything. Okay. Um, so mass spec. If you're not familiar with it, mass spectrometry is a form of analytical chemistry where you can determine if you don't know it's in a sample, you can determine what's in your sample based on the the um, data you get from a mass spec. So it busts up a compound or a sample into several different parts. Um, and when it busts it up, you can kind of say, okay, we know that um, this particular, if you have a large amount of one particular compound, let me see if I can explain this better. In a mass spec, when you're running it through the instrument, it's going to break up your compound into components. The smallest amount that you have on your data is going to be your entire mo molecule. So that's going to be what your total mass is for that compound. Now, when it breaks it up into parts, you can kind of determine what the chemical makeup is of whatever it is that you're trying to figure out that's in a sample based on how it breaks apart in the patterns that it has. Does that make sense? And then there's also, so there's a mass spec database where you can take the data that you have, run it through a database and get hit facts on, on what you think your compound is. So if you have a solution and you don't know what it is, you can run a mass spec, look at the data, how it breaks that compound apart based on its mass, and that's kind of how scientists determine um, what what is in a sample based on mass alone and how it breaks apart when they run it through a mass spec. Does that make sense? Indeed it does. It does. I, I, oh, Andy's I, back. Hopefully we'll be able to actually share properly this time, but that... It really does have slides, trust great me. To describe. I, I do, I, I swear, I did work. <laughs> <laughs> I All saw right. your work earlier. It's nice work. You did a good job. Well, thank All you. Right. Let's see if um, let's see if I can share this time and not have my screen continuously collapsing in on itself. I don't know what in the world I did there, but All right. Yeah, just uh it, it, yeah, present present your window, click on you, then I'll present you and life will be good. Yeah, everything worked the first time. I don't know why it didn't work the second time. We get, we got it. You're up. You have rectified the issue. Okay, now I will present you. Okay, yay! I fixed it. Here we go. Okay. I love computers. Sometimes you just got to restart. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so as as Mel already so eloquently described what it is that a mass spectrometer does. Uh, I, I got kind of beat through my first slide here. So uh, 
Yeah, uh, mass spec is utilized to determine particular isotope structures, and I, I am taking this maybe on a little bit more of the physics end than on the chemistry end, but being able to determine being able to ter determine the mass of anything to a certain level of precision actually allows you to measure how many protons, how many electrons, how many neutrons are in something. So then you start getting into the isotope structure. And this, if you remember back when we were doing the episode on particle accelerators, uh, much of the same uh, technology actually goes into how it is that mass spec equipment operates because, well, more slides, we'll get to them. So uh, 1918 saw the first utilizing certain pieces of equipment. If you remember, again, from the particle accelerator series, hopefully you remember what that piece of equipment is. If not, don't worry, I'm going to bring it up here in a little bit. And thanks to other work done uh, by 1929, it's, I, I actually think I was wrong on that. I think it was 1927. But either way, utilizing gases in mass spec is far more efficient than obviously trying to slam a solid into something. So when we are just, when, when we're discussing these different masses of particles and what it is that isotopes are. A periodic table is absolutely great. It's phenomenal. I think everyone should own one, but at the same rate, it's kind of a giant lie in my opinion. The chart of the nuclides is actually the information that you really need to have if you're going to sit down and start talking chemistry. And I'm, Mel, don't yell at me yet. <laughs> I know I'm not a chemist. I'm just an engineer, but <laughs> it's okay. just... I'm not gonna yell at you. I would never yell at people. Not unless you're rude, then I might I might yell a little bit and get really angry, but that's okay. Just well, an I'm, engineer. I'm, I'm just saying that. I am I'm only an engineer. You're the chemist, and if <laughs> if I do give wrongful information, I do want you to yell at me and stop me. <laughs> I will politely give you a nudge and say, I think you are on the right path but there's possibly another perspective you might want to consider. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Politeness. Either way. So, with, <laughs> so as I say, the, the, the periodic table is phenomenal. It gives you a world of information that is hard to find elsewhere, but the chart of the nuclides is, I mean, if you, if you imagine sitting down and taking a look at a periodic table, it's the contents of a book. The chart of the nuclides is the book. So when you hear people talking about, well, there's there's hydrogen, but there's there's hydrogen too. Okay, well that quite literally, th these are isotopes. They are structures of an element that, moving on to the next slide, what it is that isotopes are, they're the word isotope literally refers to two things occupying the same place, same space. So in chemistry, referring to elements with the same number of protons, yet different number of neutrons. So if we hop back over to this small portion of the chart of the nuclides, I assure you it's much larger. Hydrogen, hydrogen two. So same single proton, different neutrons. And moving forward in how all of this work actually started taking place, the as far as using utilizing the word isotopes in the world of chemistry, that took place uh, by Frederick Soddy in 1911. And uh, by a certain point in time, obviously, you come to enough discovery that you realize, hey, this thing and this thing are different, but they're the same. And that's when you really get to start learning some awesome stuff. So uh, I may be wrong on being first stable isotopes detected as far as the slide is concerned, but it was the 
the beginning of mass spec utilized in the world of chemistry, to my knowledge and my understanding, was by F.W. Aston. And again, if we pop back over, I know it's hard to see, and I apologize for that, but neon 20, stable isotope, neon 22, stable isotope. So you have what's going on with neon is you have 10 protons, 10 neutrons, and that's neon 20. As opposed to when you jump over to neon 22, you still have 10 protons, but now you have 12 neutrons. And that's, that's everything that makes up the chart of the nuclides. It's every formation of how elements can exist. And neon is neon, whether it has 20, 21, 22, 26, radioactively unstable, it's gonna, yeah, you, you don't wanna be anywhere near that, but <laughs> it's the generalized way that the entire table works. You have stable isotopes, you have unstable isotopes. And these this is, this equipment using a mass spec, being able to measure that mass to such a level of precision that you can actually determine this particular element is neon, but it's neon with 10 protons and 10 neutrons as opposed to it's still neon, but it's neon with 10 protons and 12 neutrons. It's, it's an incredibly high level of precision, as you can imagine. You, even a scanning electron microscope can't physically take a picture of an atom. So being able to measure mass allows us that opportunity to really determine and see how, see what things are made of. Uh, the basic technology behind how it is that a uh, mass spec works, aside from all the awesome stuff Mel's already told us. <laughs> so, this is where we get back to where our particle accelerator show has some technology overlap, if you will. So mass spec, it, 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 there's four, four basic points, ionization, acceleration, deflection, and detection. So ionizing your sample, and this is obviously why utilizing gases as opposed to solids is uh, the method. Everything needs to be positively charged. It's being ionized. Sometimes you're shredding electrons. It, sometimes you shred too many. Sometimes you don't shred enough. But first, the sample's ionized. It then goes through an accelerator, which typically, from my knowledge at least, is a cyclotron. The cyclotron accelerates the particles. Uh, they are sent through an electromagnetic region of the piece of equipment and this i don't know if you guys see my cursor or not but depending on the radius in this bend you're going to be able to actually separate heavier and lighter molecules so if you if you have absolutely no idea what your target is you're going to have a completely different piece of equipment from knowing my target is c14 if you know I want to measure C14, you're going to have a very specified, a very specific piece of equipment engineered for that purpose. So there's there's a wide range of different pieces of equipment when it comes to mass spec. It's not a there isn't some be all end all. This thing can tell you everything about the universe. Tool that's just not how it works. <laughs> So throughout this process, after your sample is accelerated and it's deflected, it's deflected by this electromagnetic field that's generated, obviously, artificially. And lighter particles will be deflected at a much greater rate than heavier particles. So they're, they'll collide with the wall. They'll never make it to the detector. You don't measure them. Heavier particles won't be deflected as much they will run into the opposing wall. This looks almost like a mixture of what you call time of flight as well as the quadrupole. The quadrupole works on like ACDC. So you can adjust and tweak the settings to where the molecules that you're not interested in will kind of bounce off in the fray and the ones that you want will pass through and then get to the detector. 
Now, when you're talking about time of flight, time of flight has to do with smaller bits and larger bits. The larger bits are gonna be slower than the smaller bits. So if you're doing time of flight, all of the particles, it's almost like a race. All of the particles go at the, at, at start at the starting line and then they're, they kind of fly at the same, they're, they're released at the same time, but the larger, the larger particles are gonna be small, they're slower than the smaller ones. So the smaller ones are gonna get there first. So you can kind of, if you know what your sample is, you can kind of time to a degree. And, you, and that's what, what you have like instrumentation for in regards to the, the computer. It's able to tell you and break that down. This came first, this came second, this came third, this came fourth. And that comes out on your chart. That's pretty cool. <laughs> it really is. It's, it, it, it's, I sometimes I really dislike the way the television shows try and, you know, I, I don't actually watch television, but I hear people talk about uh, what they saw on the show and, oh yeah, the scientist goes and puts something in a mass spec and, okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> this is a field of science. It's not a, it's not a tool. It is a field of science. Oh, guys, it takes guys. a little bit more understanding than just oh throw that crap in there and it's going to tell you everything. We need a we need a conflict resolved in the chat. There is a uh, there is. <laughs> oh, I can't see the chat right now, so I'm oh. going to go ahead and hop oh. out and. All right, let me put this back. There is a discussion going on as to uh, uh, you have, I, whichever one you want to take it by all means. Um, there, there's a discussion going on, as we mentioned, uh, uh, hydrogen, deuterium, and tritium, and heavy water has, has uh, come into the discussion. And I think there just needs to be a little clarification between uh, deuterium and what heavy water is. Uh, who, do, who, who wants it? It's up in the air. Who wants it? <laughs> Mel, you are the seasoned chemist. I believe this is your field. If Mel, you're look okay up. with that. Mel, look up. That's, that's the bus. That's the bus you've just been thrown under. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I, I've just looked at heavy water because I haven't heard that term. So heavy water is a form of water that contains a larger than normal amount of the hydrogen isotope deuterium. So hydrogen, when it's in the deuterium form, we know that isotopes have a different number of neutrons, not protons, right? Because if we change the proton number, we change the element. So that's essentially what an isotope is, is a change in number of neutrons. And so heavy water would be deuterium with water, with oxygen. So that's D2O, that's technically a compound. So they were saying um, heavy water has got to be a compound in that regard. So yes. So if you're talking about hydrogen, two hydrogens with two removed neutrons combined together with an oxygen, that's still going to be a compound. But those are going to be isotopic forms of hydrogen hydrogen that are bonded to that oxygen, um, and that's essentially what heavy water is. So, just for clarification. There we go. I, I hope that answered the question. That's that's heavy water is in fact a compound, and deuterium <laughs> is an isotope <laughs> of hydrogen. <laughs> so that's there's the the uh, you, you folks that were discussing that. I, I hope. Uh, I hope that clarified it. Right. A, a, a good a way that I always like trying to think about how, you know, considering isotopes and how they exist. If you mm -hmm. ate sodium, you would die. <laughs> if you <laughs> ate potassium, you would die. If okay. you hold inhaled up. chlorine, you would die. All right, hold on. I got to go but put my chlorine you, in. <laughs> you will no also die if you don't have sodium chloride. So there's, there are elements that we require to sustain our lives, and we need to have them. But they are they're varying isotopes of. <laughs> well, you know, sodium and chloride in their ionic forms by themselves are problematic, but together, there, I think there was a video I saw once, and I used to play this in class and trying to talk about ionic bonds. Ionic bonds are a thing. Oh yeah. Okay. You have like two volatile friends 
You don't want to spend time alone with sodium because it's going to mess you up. You don't want to spend time alone with chlorine because it's going to mess you up. So you get two volatile friends together and they just go at it and they're like, they kind of cancel each other out. And then it's, it's okay for you to hang around with both of them together. <laughs> it's all right. So that's kind of how um, ionic chemistry kind of works to where the volatile aspects of those electrons that are so free that would cause all these explosions going on in your body, they interact with chlorine, you know, lacking, well, no, needing, it, it pulls, it pulls over that electron over from, from sodium because it's constantly wanting to give it off and chlorine's like, I need that electron. And so they go together. And so then it's not so problematic for you because they're, they're handling their, their business. <laughs> Indeed, that's a great Mel, way of putting it. Mel, have you ever thought of teaching? <laughs> you know, I can legally teach three subjects right now, and I do have an active license. Hey, hey, <laughs> I got news for you. Yeah. You're, you're teaching right. You're teaching right now, and so are you, Andy. <laughs> I, I, get it with my hair up. I do. My hair is in a bun today because I was very lazy. <laughs> like I'm just gonna put it up in a bun. Uh. Right. Librarian scientist Mel. <laughs> All right, well, scientist Mel is scientist Mel, and once again, I'm really glad that you joined us for this series. It's, this is going to be fun. Indeed, I think so. Fun so far, yeah, absolutely. You guys are fun, and you have great like voices. You have like really nice presenting voices. Oh wow! Well. Oh, a, thank I, you. I am honored. <laughs> right. I, I, I have just a little bit more stuff to get rid of. And uh, let's see. Ooh, and I even have another video. Woohoo! It's a uh, oh, right. lucky, like, like you said, Mel. It's 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 uh, what they used to call them. It's film strip day in class. Yay! It's like <laughs> video day in class. It's awesome. My my students always love that. I pull out a Professor Brian Cox, and I'm like, oh, can we watch Cosmos? Let's get through the lecture. We can. <laughs> Here's a question well, I don't I think suddenly I, I, I feel would old because answered. I remember when I was tasked with making sure that the reel was attached to the reel. Okay, neither you kids. I'm not that old. Neither what the you heck? kids know what a film strip is, do you? Okay, you don't know what film strip day was. I, I just heard <laughs> silence when I said that. No, I remember exactly what film strip day was because I was tasked with the job of making sure that one reel attached to the other. Oh, oh all right. I thought you were talking about mo where they had reels like movies. No, film strip was like a slideshow just in a strip. But anyway, um, all right. Uh, they, they, oh, the, heck, the, I mean, I still even have my slide projector. A <laughs> chunk. And this is, us in, this is us in Mount Loa trying to get into the observatory. Anyway, um, they cost less than having actual pictures printed. Okay, it was easier. Agreed. Agreed. <laughs> All right. In fact, it, the, the the last thing I had anything to say about today was a subject that I think by now everybody knows is a subject near and dear to my heart, which is uh, the oceans. So, as you might live at the shore, I'm uh, very fond of sea life in general, uh, the various ecosystems, and things of that sort. So, I just wanted to say a little bit about that. Um, there's, a, there's a current that does some interesting things for us. Uh, it's the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation. Uh, it acts as kind of a conveyor belt of ocean water from Florida to Greenland. Now, what this does for us, or what it used to do better for us, and the more we stress it, it's kind of, well, trying to keep up its end, is uh, water near the surface picks up uh, greenhouse gases from the air. And um, as it uh, as the water uh, moves towards Greenland, the water cools, that sinks down. Um, so what happens is that effectively the ocean buries these gases in the deep ocean where various little tiny life forms make use of it. And uh, in the past, would have completely removed it. We're kind of overloading the system these days. Uh, I have a little video on that. It's very short. Let me bring it up here, and you can see what that's all about.
there you go. Well, I promised it was going to be short. That sort of just graphically demonstrates what I was just talking about. Um, so, the oceans uh, obviously tend to absorb greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide and heat from the atmosphere, um, which is really handy for us. There are, however, limits. Um, and on that note, uh, Mel, I, I believe I shall turn it over to you. Sweet. Let me get my stuff up together because okay. I've done things too. Cool. <laughs> T- tell me when. Tell me when you're ready. I will present you. Okay. I'm clicking on it here. Window. Okay, I'm ready. All right, hold on. Let me get you presented. I will click on you, and I will click on this. You are presented. Please proceed. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> so this is a cartoon I found. I can't read the artist's name in the bottom corner, but it's there. <laughs> so, <laughs> but here's here's our aquatic life. We're going to need a really big antacid tablet, and yeah, maybe a couple. So we're reaching a lower pH in regards to the oceans, and this is a problem, and I'm going to talk about why. But first, we need to talk a little bit about the ocean, how it's absorbed, how it absorbs um, carbon dioxide. In addition to a little bit of chemistry, I promise I will not scare people with um, the chemistry. I will break it down pretty easy. Okay, I I literally just tried to explain exactly how a mass spectrometer works, so I don't think anyone's afraid of your knowledge here, Mel. <laughs> use the chemistry. I'm terrified. So, use it. <laughs> use, the, use the chemistry, Luke. That, that would have not made a very good film, I don't think, if they just, instead of force, put chemistry or physics. But that well, would have been fun. Well, it might have been cool. I don't know. You never know. Yoda might have been talking about chem. Might have been a little bit, you know, the midi chlorians, whatever. (laughs) There you go. (laughs) So here I have a picture from earthobservatory.nasa.gov. So a lot of the stuff, and I'll have like most of my my sources listed on slides. If not, I do have a giant slide at the end, and most of it's from NOAA, NOAA. So they have a substantial amount of information there. So when we're looking at this particular picture, this one in short-term activity, ocean of, the o- ocean absorbs atmospheric carbon dioxide into the mixed layer. So the mixed layer is not you know, the top, it's not the deep ocean, it just hangs out in the center here. So we have this wind going on and the wind kind of works like a little stir bar. It kind of mixes everything involved in the mixed layer, which keeps it kind of with nearly uniform temperature, salinity, and dissolved gases. So it kind of stays pretty uniform in this mixed layer. So that's the short term. So in long-term activities, carbon dioxide slowly moves to the deep ocean. So we don't have a lot of mixing going on here because, you know, it's the wind. It doesn't really penetrate the ocean and shake things up down here. So the carbon dioxide can can move to the depths of the deep ocean towards the bottom of the mixed layer, as well as in areas where cold depths like in the pole. So we're talking like the North Pole, the South Pole, we're going to see more carbon dioxide kind of sink towards the bottom of the mixed layer and towards the deep ocean. So the question here is, is what happens when CO2 causes acidification? of the ocean. So I have a graph here. And again, this is from earthobservatory.nasa.gov. So here we're looking at the concentration of ocean carbon dioxide. This is CO2. This is the y-axis. So this is the concentration of carbon dioxide um, in the ocean carbon dioxide. Now, the shaded areas are the amount of atmospheric carbon dioxide. Now, the temperature is the x-axis. So we have temperature here, and we have concentration of carbon dioxide going up and down. Now, notice, notice, when the temperature is low, the amount of ocean carbon dioxide is low, right? Well, I'm sorry, wrong way around. 
I got it backwards. The graph shows that as atmospheric CO2 increases, and we have pre-industrial atmospheric carbon dioxide. Here's our current atmospheric carbon dioxide. And this is if we were to get to two times the amount of atmospheric carbon dioxide. The colder it is, the, the um, more increased amount of carbon dioxide there is in ocean. All right, so this is the increased amount of carbon dioxide in the ocean. I'm getting it backwards. This is a weird graph for me. <laughs> so if we have um, hotter temperatures, we have less amount of carbon dioxide in the ocean. So this is pre-industrial atmospheric carbon dioxide, current atmospheric carbon dioxide, and then we do have some numbers for projections of two times the amount of atmospheric carbon dioxide is going to become a problem to where it cannot um, metabolize it so well. So what we're looking at is as water temperature increases, its ability to dissolve carbon dioxide decreases. All right, so the global warming is expected to reduce the ocean's ability to absorb CO2 leaving much more in the atmosphere and less in the ocean. And this will then lead to even higher temperatures because we know carbon dioxide absorbs heat and it keeps things hot. This is what we call a greenhouse gas. Now this particular graph was made by Robert Simmons in the Earth Observatory. Now, I, I, I gotta jump in real fast, Mel. I completely agree the way that <clears throat> The manner in which this graph is drawn is a little bit perplexing. It, it's it is it seems backwards because yes. <laughs> as as atmospheric CO two increases, the ocean is oh our oceans, mm -hmm. which is just one giant body of water. Realistically, there's just one ocean. Right. I don't know why we name them different things, but the ocean is it's not able to absorb as much carbon dioxide due to how warm it has gotten. Yes, that's so, exactly correct. Yes, the, the, the graph seems inverse. Yes. So what they're looking at here is essentially what you have to pay attention to is the temperature. The hotter the ocean, the less amount of carbon dioxide that it has in it. That's what this is. So um, pre-industrial atmospheric carbon dioxide if we have um, a sweet spot with a temperature like around here where we're not getting ridiculously hot, then we're talking about the ocean's ability to be able to dissolve carbon dioxide a bit better. The hotter it is, the less ability it has to dissolve atmospheric carbon dioxide. So let's talk about why it's important that it's able to dissolve atmospheric carbon dioxide. All right, so this is um, what we have here are little models, little molecules of carbon dioxide, water, carbonate ion, and bicarbonate ions. So when CO2 is absorbed by the ocean, so carbon dioxide gets absorbed by the ocean, there are chemical reactions that occur that reduce the pH and carbonate ion concentration. All right, so the saturation states of calcium carbonate minerals is very, very important. And so in turn, if we have a hotter ocean, we have less of this form of carbonate ion. And what we end up is up with is two bicarbonate ions instead of just carbonate. So the hotter the ocean gets, the more we get this form, this bicarbonate ion, as opposed to this carbonate ion. Now this carbonate ion is biologically significant because it is used in a vast majority of marine life species. So I'll talk about okay. that in just a minute. Mel. Yes. Mel, I was about to hop in just real quick. When it comes when it when it comes to uh, calcification and things of that nature, this is a very this is a very good indication of the amount of time that's elapsed between something being deposited and not, correct? Yes. Okay, do, 
I think we should uh, maybe make a show about that. Okay. That sounds good I think to that'd me. be a lot of fun because that there is a there is a completely different realm of uh, determining how long things have been sitting around that also help with our knowing how it was when it was. Right. Um, so yes, uh, in regard to these reactions, some reactions happen faster than others. So we can talk about the kinetics of that if you like. On another show, we can get more into the chemistry if you'd like. Um, oh, yeah, definitely. But yeah, another show. You're right. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. I have a, I have a lot to cover. <laughs> so these carbonate ions. Now, this, these chemical reactions that occur reduce the pH the carbonate ion concentration, and the saturation states of the calcium carbonate you were talking about in those minerals. So we need a large amount of this calcium carbonate. So this carbonate ion is integral to that calcium carbonate mineral that's used that we find in marine life. So these chemical reactions are termed ocean acidification, or OA for short. So if you're not familiar with pH, here we have um, a little diagram I got from Britannica. Higher concentration of atmospheric CO2 causes an increase in carbonic acid, thus increasing free pH, I mean, sorry, free hydrogen ions. Now hydrogen ions, the increased amount of hydrogen ions decreases the pH, so it has an inverse mathematical relationship. P, if you're not familiar with the letter P, when you see P in front of pH, that P literally means the natural log of. So mathematical, you can have a pOH, which is natural log of hydroxide ions or, or the concentration of. So a pH is the natural log of hydrogen ions. So the increased amount of hydrogen ions is going to give you that lower pH, so it's an inverse mathematical relationship. So if we're look, looking at um, late 1800s, reduced acidity, lower concentration of atmospheric CO2, we have carbon dioxide, it goes into the ocean, the ocean absorbs it into that mixed layer. Then we have this carbonic um, acid, well that's going to leave off some free hydrogen ions, but we will have some bicarbonate, but we're gonna have far more carbonic acid and just a few, you know, free hydrogen ions. Now, 2100, the projected increased acidity, it's going to cause a large amount of these free hydrogen ions. We're going to have less carbonic acid. So therefore we're gonna have fewer carbonate ions as well as an increased amount of bicarbonate. So we're not going to have so many minerals that a lot of these particular types of marine life need in order to develop their biological structures, including shells and skeletons. So um, let's look a little bit at the chemistry so everybody can freak out right now because I have chemical equations up. <laughs> <laughs> so here, <laughs> this is another, another source. But, or another thing from NOAA. So we have gas exchange. So you can have carbon dioxide in gas form within a liquid. That's what your bubbles are, you know, kind of in your sodas, right? So you can still have gas inside the ocean in the bubble form. So it goes in these little arrows here. This is what we call equilibrium arrows. So when you see back and forth, that means the carbonic acid is transitioning between CO2 and water, the carbon, carbonic acid back and forth. So this particular reaction here, we have our CO3, this oxygen hops over onto the carbon dioxide molecule and these hydrogen ions hop over in here. That's ideal, which means you're gonna have fewer free hydrogens, which means you're not going to change the pH of the ocean so much. Now, if we look at the bicarbonate, um, ion. This is the one we don't want so much of, right? We don't want so much of this. We, we'd much rather have the carbonate ion because that can work with calcium in order to build our cell. So we've got bicarbonate here. This, this carbon, carbonic acid then comes down over here 
this hydrogen is going to pop off of here, and then you're going to have bicarbonate ion. Now, um, some people will be like, well, what about, you know, this carbon? Well, if you understand how this bonding works, this carbon is happy because it has three oxygens on it, and this hydrogen is attached to it. Oxygen can hold a negative charge and be just fine in water because it has free floating hydrogen ions. So it can transition from this back and forth pretty easily. So if you have a high amount of CO2 in solution, it's going to, or at least in atmosphere, it's going to overwhelm to a degree to this carbonic acid. You're going to have these free hydrogen ions that are going to make more of this bicarbonate. You're going to have considerably less of the carbonate. Form, which is essential for um, with the calcium carbonate for mollusks, uh, mussels, various types of sea snails, coral reefs, and some zooplankton. And so here, when we're looking at this, this diagram of the carbon dioxide system in seawater, the one time carbon dioxide concentrations are for a surface ocean in equilibrium with pre industrial atmospheric. Um, carbon dioxide level. So this is pre-industrial, right? And these are projections that we're looking at that could happen in the second half of the century. So we're looking at, and these are in parts per million. So this 280 is in parts per million. Oh, sorry. <laughs> That's late. And then here we're talking about double that. So this is 560 parts per million. So what we're looking at is instead of having eight of these, we're having 15, but notice we're dropping considerably less in the carbonate ions, all right? So the two times carbon dioxide concentration, again, this is for surface and ocean equilibrium, so it's going back and forth between the two. So we've managed to get a steady state between carbon dioxide and gas form and in solution, all right? So current projections show that this particular level that we have in red, with a low pH of 7.91 with current trends, this is what can happen in the second half of the century. Now, in regards to the amounts here, this is in micromoles per kilogram. So we have 15 micromoles of this versus eight, and we have considerably less carbonate ions as what we want. We have an increased amount of bicarbonate. These are current projections, again, from NOAA. So by 2094, we should have an average pH of 7.8. So this is pretty frightening. <laughs> yeah, that makes me hope that I never know anyone that swims in the ocean by 2100. It's just, I mean. Like that, will, that will actually hurt. The, well, our, our, our natural bodies tend to maintain a pH of 7.2 to 7.5, usually like in blood level in most tissues. I'm not talking like your stomach or anything like that. I'm not talking about specific. Um, oh, on yeah. No, no. I, I, I totally understand. I'm just saying swimming in water that was at 7.8, that would, that would not feel very fun. Well, well, I mean, it's, it's, water in the bathtub is 7.0, customarily, we think. You know, if we were to just swim in pure water, that would be 7.0, which is neutral. So this wouldn't hurt so bad to us, but to animals that live in the ocean at that pH, that affects them greatly because it tends to be more alkaline than it does acidic. Let's look at the various forms of life that are affected by this. So pretty much anything that has to do with calcium um, carbonate is going to be affected. Um, and there's also some data to show that fish kind of go crazy a little bit. So I'll talk a little bit about that. So ocean acidification is affecting biodiversity, marine life, physiological development through that calcium carbonate ion rise in seagrass population and decline in algae. This acidosis that we see where fish try to maintain this homeostasis that they need with, you know, overall pH, they, they have to regulate their bodies to keep their pH at a level to where they can, they can live. They have this 
acidosis effects in how they respond to predation. And there's also metabolic effects to where they have to burn more energy in order to maintain the pH that their bodies need. So here's a little bit on ocean, ocean acidification. And there's this, again, this chemistry that you've seen before here, the carbon dioxide with the water forms the carbonate ion, but then that's being pushed to make two bicarbonate ion, bicarbonate ions because of the fact there's a high amount of CO2. So this reaction is more favored. So when you're talking about concentration, when we're talking about, I should say, when you're talking about those equilibrium, let me jump back a bit. When you're talking about those equilibrium reactions, if you increase the amount of one thing, it's going to push it more towards this way. I mean, that's just how it works. So if you increase anything here on this side, in order to compensate for that large amount of carbon dioxide, it's going to push it more towards the right where you're, you're going to have more product as well. So when we talk about equilibrium, if you increase one side, it's going to push the reaction more towards the right in order to compensate for that. I mean, that's just thermodynamics. Um, so we end up with these bar bicarbonate ions because that's the preferred state as opposed to the carbonate ions. Now, I'm sorry, I, I, I got to interrupt one last time. I love when chemists use physics. <laughs> it's just thermodynamics. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so calcium carbonate molecules are essential for building blocks. So we need these particular this particular form to interact with calcium in order for the, that overall mineral. Now, carbonate by itself is not sufficient. It has to interact with calcium in order to build those shells. And so calcium carbonate molecules are essential building blocks for the skeleton structures and shells of many forms of marine life. In the most biodiverse and heavily populated areas in the ocean, seawater is super saturated with respect to calcium carbonate. There are abundant building blocks in the form of these minerals present for calcifying organisms to build their biological support structures. Yet, continued ocean acidification is causing many ocean areas to become undersaturated with these building blocks, with these minerals. So we have this high increased amount of this acidification. We don't have the carbonate ions to interact with that calcium. We have these bicarbonate forms that's not going to help. And if um, ocean creatures are absorbing, you know, consumption of these particular carbonate ions, this is going to impede calcification because we don't have it interacting with calcium. So there's a lot, there's a lot of chemistry here that we can get into, but we don't have a whole lot of time for that now. But essentially, the bicarbonate ions end up being what our final form is, and calcium does not work with that. Okay, so. Um, this continued ocean acidification is causing many ocean areas to become undersaturated with these building blocks, which will more than likely continue to affect the ability of some marine organisms to produce and maintain their structures. We have evidence now that shows that the shells of different types of organisms are degrading due to the increased, due to the increased amount of hydrogen ions, you know, the lower pH, and they're not able to rebuild as quickly. So here, this comes to us from um, ocean.si.edu. There was a lab experiment that was performed on a sea butterfly, a pteropod. The shell was placed in seawater with increased acidity slowly over a period of 45 days. And this picture is courtesy of David Litschwager of National Geographic Society. So, what we see here is over a period of time, it slowly starts to dissolve the outer shell. And these organisms are not able to replenish the shell quickly, as quickly as it is dissolving. So here on the right, we have this graph that shows rising levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and rising carbon dioxide levels in the ocean. You had a similar graph earlier with um, this, this was taken off the coast of Hawaii. So this is part of the carbon program from NOAA. So we can see that atmospheric carbon dioxide is going up, 
seawater um, carbon dioxide is going up and the seawater pH is going down. We have a large amount of hydrogen ions that are being released, which means we're, we're having considerably less um, carbonate ions in that form that those particular ocean creatures need. So what organisms overall are affected by this ocean acidification? Coral reefs. Now, if you're familiar with coral reefs, they are essential for promoting diet biodiversity in the ocean. They have plants, animals, as well as contribute to symbiotic relationships between organisms, even prey and predators can use coral reefs um, and they go back and forth a bit to where they don't actually harm each other. I don't know if you're familiar with some of the interactions that they have, but coral reefs are absolutely amazing and crucial for um, in, in their own ecosystem in, in that they house a large amount of various types of marine life. The decrease in pH is causing coral reefs to steadily erode. While some can use bicarbonate in order to build their structures. That bicarbonate ion, some species can do that. Many still use carbonate ions, just like the mussels and the conches that I mentioned before. The acidification also kills off the larva of some species of coral. And it's expected with current prediction models by 2080 that coral reefs will erode more quickly than they can rebuild. So the more um, acidic the ocean becomes, the less likely coral reefs will be able to survive because the larva can, you know, and they can live inside of a coral reef, but once they're released into the ocean, they tend to die. So they can't even procreate so well in this um, lower pH environment. Zooplankton. Now, there are two types of zooplankton that build shells that are made of this calcium carbonate. That's the formin form forminifera and the teropsids, okay, or pteropods. <laughs> oh, biology. <laughs> they are critical to the carbon cycle. And the reason why they're important to the carbon cycle, the carbon cycle is the carbon dioxide breakdown cycle, kind of that we've been touching on a little bit today. So when zooplankton, as well as other types of shelled phytoplankton die and sink to the sea floor, they carry those shells that they have, those calcium carbonate shells with them. This is an important way that carbon dioxide is kind of removed from the atmosphere, slowing that rise in temperature that's caused currently by the greenhouse effect with the increased amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Now, in regards to adaptation, Certain species of zooplankton do reproduce so rapidly that they may be able to adapt to acidity better than many of the larger and slower reproducing animals. However, the research on carbon dioxide seeps where we see the pH is low shows foraminifera, they do not handle the high acidity so well. Um, and their shells start to quickly dissolve. So that's going to be a problem that a lot of these species are not gonna be able to overcome. They're not gonna be able to rebuild their shells as quickly as they're dissolving. Another study shows projections that for foraminifera in tropical areas where it's already hot, there will, they will be extinct by the end of the century and shells of pteropods are dissolving already in the Southern Ocean. The Acidic water from the deep sea kind of rises to the surface and that kind of contributes to it. Now, like corals, these particular sea, cell, sea snails are very, very susceptible because their shells are made of argonite. Argonite is an extremely delicate form of calcium carbonate that is 50% more soluble in seawater. So that means it's getting eaten away pretty quickly and dissolving. Now, in regards to the jellyfish population, people don't know, scientists don't know 100% what these acidification effects are gonna have on that. And many in this case are afraid that it is that they will survive unharmed. Jellyfish compete with other fish and predators for food and they do feed on zooplankton and they also eat other forms of young fish. 
Now, if jellyfish were to thrive under these warm and more acidic conditions, while most of the other organisms suffer, it is very possible that the jellyfish population is going to be kind of, kind of go out of control and dominate some ecosystems. Now, this is already a problem that's kind of seen in other parts of the ocean. Jellyfish everywhere will have to be SpongeBob and go jellyfishing. <laughs> Try to help the population, man. You're going to go hunting, hunt you some jellyfish in those areas, or also like the, um, what was it? The crown, oh, there's a particular predator that, that eats up the coral reef. And it's natural, it's the uh, crown of thorns um, starfish. They're, they actually have bounties on that because of the fact so many people have harvested their natural predator. Um, oh, what's their natural predator's name? It's a type of sea snail. That's the only predator that can kill the crown of thorns starfish. And because so many people have harvested that for their beautiful shells, the, um, it's eating up the coral reef, especially around um, the Caribbean. So we have ocean acidification in addition to the crown of thorns starfish. They, they have bounties on them now. I, I don't know what the latest information is on that, but that was going on about five years ago. So I imagine not much has changed. <laughs> I'm really sorry to interrupt, but freighter chaos. <laughs> Dude. <laughs> What I miss. Lord and Savior Jelly Kraken. I I I think that gets an automatic intro or an automatic. <laughs> uh, you're in the drawing for the <laughs> series giveaway. That's... Jelly Kraken. All right. Indeed. <laughs> and this one gets stung. <laughs> I'm almost done, guys. I only have a couple slides left, and I'll be done. And then you know everybody can go do their Sunday how they want. <laughs> okay. Let's, let the learning continue. Indeed. All right. So now we're looking at plants and algae. Now seagrasses. Seagrasses are involved in what we call shallow water ecosystems, and we find these along the coast. Many, many of these particular ecosystems are nurseries for the larger species of fish. The larger species of fish will have their babies here and they hang out and stuff. So like coral reefs, they can be home to thousands of different organisms. So we have a huge amount of biodiversity here. Now the good news is when tested under more acidic lab conditions, they were able to reproduce better, grow taller and grow deeper roots. So these are considered good things. So this is some good news. Um, but the thing is, yet yeah, they're considered, they are in decline from pollution flowing into coastal seawater. So these are still, we still have issues in regards to seagrasses because their numbers are declining, even though they're kind of thriving in this acidic environment and they're providing um, housing, much like coral reefs, they're still declining in numbers because of pollution that's flowing into coastal seawater. Now it's, Scientists and researchers feel that it's unlikely this acidification boost will compensate for the losses caused by these other environmental stressors. There are some algae that grows better under more acidic conditions with that boost in carbon dioxide. So that's okay. We got some algae that are, that are doing all right. But the algae that has that calcium carbonate, we keep coming back to that. A lot of marine life thrives and relies heavily on that mineral. So the coralline algae, they have calcium carbonate skeleton. They don't adjust so well to this change of pH. They build their shells from high magnesium calcite form of calcium carbonate. Now, this compound, you remember we talked about aragonite, that particular form of calcium, all right, that, that dissolves. Now this compound is more soluble than that aragonite. So it's fallen apart even faster than that other pteropod that we were talking about. Researchers in one investigation found that the coralline algae in acidic conditions now covers 92% less area, making space for other types of non-calcifying algae. Now, the calcifying algae is important because it helps ground coral reefs. Now the non-calcifying algae can actually smother and damage coral reefs. This is doubly bad 
because many coral reef larvae prefer to settle in the coralline algae, in that calcified algae, when they're ready to leave the plankton stage and start growing as a coral reef. So that calcium carbonate, man, that's, that's the biggest issue. Now let's talk about how fish can go crazy. <laughs> yeah, I've been, I've been pretty eager about this one. Crazy fish, just, it <laughs> sounds fun. <laughs> Indeed. Well, we're talking, if you've ever had an aquarium, you know just slight changes in pH can kill off your fish, especially if you're dealing with freshwater. Saltwater, it's not as hard, you know, there, it's, it's not as difficult to maintain, but freshwater, oh my goodness. All right, so fish's cells often come into balance with seawater by taking in carbonic acid. So this changes the pH of the fish's blood causing a condition called acidosis. So if we have a high amount of that carbonic acid and it's not reacting with the calcium and it's being going to the bicarbonate, fish are going to compensate by stepping up and taking this in and it alters their body's pH and this is acidosis. Now, if you're looking at humans, small changes in pH can make us very, very sick. So a drop in blood pH of 0 0.2 to 0 0.3 can cause seizures, comas, and even death. So likewise, a fish is also sensitive to these fluctuations in pH and puts its body into super overdrive to bring its chemistry back to normal. So it burns a lot of extra energy to excrete the excess acid out of its blood through its gills, kidneys, and intestines. Now, you wouldn't think that this would use a lot of energy, but you gotta consider the size of the fish. <laughs> it's, it's, it's in food sources and food availability, but even a slight increase of this reduces the energy the fish has to take care of other tasks like digesting food and swimming rapidly to escape predators or to catch food, reproducing. So it has less energy to do basic survival things that it needs because it's trying to regulate its body's pH. This also slows the fish's growth. Now in even slightly more acidic water, a fish can go a little bit crazy. While clownfish can normally hear and avoid noisy predators, there have been studies to show that in more acidic water, they do not flee threatening noise. They just hang out. And clownfish also stray farther from home and have trouble finding their way back. They normally smell trying to find their way back. So they can't even smell properly. So they don't run away from predators. They get lost. They can't come back home. So it's almost like a, a weird kind of fish dementia. So this may happen because the acidification, which changes the pH of the fish's body and brain, could alter how that brain processes all this information. So additionally, cobia, which is a kind of popular game fish, grow larger otoliths, those are the small ear bones. Okay, so fish have ear bones. So the, they, they grow these larger ear bones that affects the hearing balance. So in more acidic water, this can affect their ability to navigate and avoid prey. So while there's still a lot to learn in regards to these types of fish, these findings suggest that we may see unpredictable changes in animal behavior, it, especially since they use clownfish as a model, it is reasonable to expect that other types of fish that are along similar genetic lines to the clownfish are gonna behave similarly. The ability to adapt to higher acidity is gonna ultimately vary from fish species to fish species. And what qualities will help a herd of fish, given a fish species is unknown. Also rate of reproduction. If these fish are not able to have the energy to reproduce, then they can't have the babies and make even an attempt to try to adapt. Unlike the zooplankton, which have babies rapidly, they have an opportunity to actually kind of outgrow the acidification of the ocean, but slower reproducing fish that don't have the energy in order to reproduce are going to suffer. So a shift in dominant fish species could have major impact not only on these particular ecosystems, but also on human fisheries. So let's sum up the things. We're at the end. So we talked about all these things here. 
Woohoo! So atmospheric CO2 decreases the ocean pH. So that's called um, ocean acidification, OA. Carbonate ions matter. We need them to interact with calcium so we can have that mineral form. Biodiversity and biodevelopment is threatened. Um, organisms that use that, car that calcium carbonate, they need that in order to build their shells, build their skeletons, build their other biological structures. And if it's highly acidic, it eats it away pretty quickly. And it also depends on the type of calcium carbonate. Certain type forms of calcium carbonate are much more soluble in the ocean and the increased amount of hydrogen ions, the lower the pH, it just kind of dissolves it and eats it away. Now this has a potential impact in all aquatic populations, whether it's increasing the amount of seagrass, increasing the amount of non-calcifying algae that's going to eat away at the coral reefs. You're gonna have a decreased amount of the coral reef, which is needed for biodiversity. All of these things we've talked about today. Um, that just kind of wraps that up. I have like 9 billion sources, but most of them I'm just tell you are, and I don't know if you can read that so well. If you go to www.pmel.noaa.gov slash CO2, so it's noaa.gov slash CO2, just Google that, you will find probably at least half of my sources there. Um, Scientific American has an article on writing acidity in the ocean. Ocean.si.edu slash ocean acidification. Um, Britannica, briefly, you're not going to get as much stuff there. Uh, there is also scientificamerican.com on corals, coral reefs dissolving, corals are dissolving away. In addition to a few others, NOAA.gov has um, more scientific studies if you want to break down to the actual techni technical aspects of it. Um, I would suggest going there because they have links to all of the data in the papers. Climateandlife.columbia.edu. How do higher CO2 levels impact marine life? Earthobservatory.nasa.gov. And you can look at ocean carbon. NOAA has a whole program just, it's, I believe it's called the Carbon Program. So that is all that I've got on that. that that's all. You, you actually used the word, that's all. <laughs> after giving out that much information to everyone. Seriously. <laughs> I, I would like to thank you for that much information. However, I should I, I should also probably add, but when we started up today, I was in a just a nice happy mood. Uh, not so much anymore. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm oh no, 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 no. The 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 data the data does need to get out there and um and it, uh, that kind of thing is indisputable. And I, I think the uh, conversation that it wasn't on one of the shows, but a conversation you and I had once before was that um, the argument used to be, is the uh, the rise in greenhouse gases, uh, is it caused by humans or is it just the earth doing what the earth does? And uh, that, that doesn't seem to be it anymore. And I'm pleased about that. Um, it's, the, it's more, this appears to be happening. Is there anything we can do? And that that's really well, and there's, that's the discussion that needs to happen. Not you know what caused it. Well, I know what caused. All it. right, but before we start getting in any deeper into all of that, remember we do have a little bit more of a show to stretch out over the next few weeks. Indeed, and we are going to cover every single one of these topics. So that, that spoiler are. spoiler alert versus give it all away at the get go is two different things. So you're saying stop. You're saying okay, Sai, so stop getting preachy. That's <laughs> understood, and will do. <laughs> Not a problem. But uh, oh, let, we should mention the. You know what? We should mention the prize again in case. Uh, oh, indeed. In case we have newcomers. Let me uh, let me bring that up here. Woo Woo prize! <laughs> oh, this is great. Okay. Um, at the conclusion of this uh, this series, the wrap up, which will happen on Earth Day, which is. Uh, what a joyous Sunday that shall be! Uh, is when we will be announcing who has uh, who is the, the winner of the um, uh, the, the uh, uh, climate change denier home experiment kit, <laughs> which is should be very <laughs> interesting. The link to uh, again, just like last time, uh, the link to sign up 
will be in the description for the video. And just like last time, there's a secret code. It's a very complicated secret code. Uh, the secret code this time will be, I figured this was appropriate, Roger Revelle's birthday, which is March 7th, 1909. March 7th, 1909, that will be the top secret don't tell anybody code. Um, and as I said, nice. the, 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 <laughs> the link for the form will be in the description. So uh, that's that's it for me. <laughs> Back to you, fine folk. Well, I don't think I personally have anything else to add for today. Uh, Mel, do you have anything? I don't. I, I, I meant for that to not be as long, so I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I called like four slides. I did actually call four slides and I saw what you guys were like, oh, I don't need to talk about that. Delete, 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 delete. I'm like, okay. There, there was more information? <laughs> oh, my. Well, the, there's more episodes. Of course there's going to be more information. Of course. I just, I just, yeah, that's good. I learn, I learn things every time I hang out with you guys. It's definitely appreciated. And thanks to both of you for that. Oh. We if do we're what not we can. Listening, fun, you know, so I learned about new species of marine life that I hadn't paid so much attention to in the jellyfish population. That was something I learned. This is like a learning experience for everybody hmm. because we get to dive in and look up stuff and then we learn new stuff and then we get to explain it to people. It's great. Indeed. indeed. You know, that, that was always the idea that everything about Sunday science is just dive into something that you didn't already know and let's go learn. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and what do I, what do I, what do I constantly say, Andy? None of us knows everything, but altogether we know a hell of a lot of stuff. <laughs> so, Indeed. Yeah. We know different things, which makes it really cool. Absolutely. Right. <laughs> Does anybody have anything Indeed. to add or, or you think we ought to wrap it up for this Sunday? We went a little over, but I would not have cut it down one minute. Oh. You know, we we did go a little over, but I don't think that that was uh, I don't think there was any problems in going over on today's show. Certainly not. I didn't even notice how much time had passed. All right. Well, thanks everybody yeah. for showing up. Is uh, another great Sunday science or Science Sunday? We settled on an actual thanks for name. Us, everybody. I <laughs> hope you enjoyed today's show, and yeah, come. I hope to see you again okay. next week so that we can keep going down all of the amazing science that is involved in how we know the world around us. Indeed. And if you have questions or if you want access to my slides, I can put them on my website, scientistmail.com. So if you want to like dig a bit further down or at least pull up the slides that I use to pick them through and see my notes and click on links, I'm happy to do that too. So that's all right. Well, cool. Very awesome. Thank you, scientist Mel. Welcome. <laughs> all righty. Well, good evening to all then, and, and, and thanks to everybody. Thank you. All righty. Here we go. Bye, guys. Bye.